I got an email yesterday. No, yesterday, day before yesterday. I answered it. Um, from a man who identified himself as a non-theist. And he is, he had also seen the rise up of the flat earth movement and went, how silly. And like me, thought it would just go away, but it hasn't. And he watched, um, the man I interviewed, Adam, he watched his first interview with a British guy talking about how wrong they are. And then he saw my interview with him. And he said, it blessed him. And he said, now I don't know if it was just chance or divine providence that brought you two together. But he said, you guys belong to each other. And he said, I appreciate the way you handled it. And that's coming from a guy who doesn't believe in God. And so I wrote him back and I said, I am not against real, logical, reasonable science. The Bible is not an anti-scientific book. We accept what the Bible says by faith. Faith first. But then, if it's just faith and there is absolutely no logic behind it, what does that tell you? It's like building a church on Santa Claus. There really is no... None. So, we don't build a church on that. We build a church on something that really happened. True historical facts. And I sent him a couple things about how the knowledge of Solomon, knowing that the water that came from the rivers that went down in the ocean ended up back in the rivers, when nobody else knew that, Solomon wrote it out in the Bible. And I said, and then here is, while everybody else thought that the earth was this flat, square thing, it was the Bible in Isaiah 40 that said that he sitteth on the circle of the earth, and it was the Bible that actually said that God was stretching out the heavens, and they're still stretching. And then I told him about, I said it was the Bible that David wrote about how he was made by a book where all of his members were written in it, and I said he was describing perfectly DNA, and I gave him the scriptures from the King James. It's, case he didn't have a King James and he read the wrong Bible and said I don't see how you get that out of there you get it out of the King James so I sent that to him and I know he's replied back but I haven't had a chance to read it yet but uh, just pray uh, for both of them and just pray that God will use the testimony of both Adam and this church to let people know that Christians aren't stupid I mean, we do accept this by faith. Faith first. But God said in Isaiah 53, come now, let us reason together. God is a reasoning and a reasonable and a rational God. I believe that. So anyway, just pray about that. Sister Linda Carmichael, here I'm giving prayer requests. Sister Linda Carmichael wants us to pray for her. She had some skin cancers removed and today, and she's a little bit still under that, so wants us to pray uh, for her. Oh, I got to share this. Do you remember, I think it was last week, I told you that there was a, la a lady by the name of Elaine, an older woman, that fell and broke her arm. This bone right here. Okay. Well, she had it x-rayed and they said it was, the bone had set, it was a clean break, but the bone had separated by about a centimeter or more, which is bad. Because if it didn't attach back, they would have to go in there and operate, or it wouldn't grow back right. And she prayed, she asked us to pray for her, and we did, and she prayed that God would help her through that. And she said, the other day, her alarm woke her up, and you know how sometimes you wake up and you're not all there yet. And she said she, she knew she couldn't hit the alarm with the arm that she normally would. I can't remember what all she said, but she kind of slipped out of bed and caught herself with that arm. 
and it pushed the bones back together perfectly. She just had it x-rayed, and it pushed the bones back together perfectly. Yeah. So she, when she called and talked to me, she was in a pretty good mood. She just wanted to say thank you to everybody that prayed for her. All right? 1 Peter chapter 4, this is what we do. We care about other people. We're supposed to. Um, it is said that you can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives. Amen? And so it wasn't any of us that decided that any of the rest of us would get saved. God picked us. And it wasn't any of us that decided on who would come here and be part of this church and who wouldn't. They just showed up and God brought them here. And so um, there is a way that we are supposed to treat one another. There is a way that we're so, supposed to treat even the people that hate us. And I don't like it. Being honest, I don't like because when I get when I get good and mad at somebody, I want to stay mad at them. Okay? And God has a different plan. All right? Even even amongst Bible believing Christians where we have disagreements and sometimes we let those disagreements put a wedge where it shouldn't be. Or maybe it should be, I don't know, maybe God just has a design that this part of the body needs to stay away from this part of the body. Right? You notice how you can't shake your own hand. Okay? God designed it that way. Some, some of us need to stay away from the other of us. So maybe the, all those differences that we have have a, have a purpose in it, but we all have to remember that we are all part of the same body. Same body. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. The whole point of 1 Peter is a fiery trial. And there's nothing more unifying than when brothers and sisters are going through some bad stuff. Amen? There's nothing more unifying than when bad, really bad things happen. And we forget about all these little things that we were bickering about or that we didn't like about each other or that kind of drove us apart. We forget about those things and we come together. That's what we're supposed to do. So that's why Peter said, above all things. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. I want you to think about that. Think of, if you can think of a story in the Bible that you think matches what Peter just said here. Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. I've often thought about this passage. And it really is part of what I want out of me. What I want out of me is to love people. And to love them unconditionally. Love them regardless. And I want that more than I want anything. Is to be able to love people the way Jesus loves me. Ask yourself, how hard is it that, that for Jesus to put up with just you? Now multiply that times every Christian that's ever walked this walk of faith. And Jesus, I mean, guys, it's one thing to love one wife. Okay? But Christ has every member of the church as a wife, as his bride. All right? And of course, he's God, he's Christ, he's got it covered, but he's, he's our example of how even when 
Even when we go and we complain to God, and we're mad about something that didn't go right, or we're mad about something that didn't go our way, or we're mad about how our prayer didn't get answered the way we thought it should, and we give that complaint to God, and God takes that from us and doesn't slap us around for it. He just loves us. Think about that. Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Let's go to the Father and ask for light tonight. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this, uh, this teaching. We thank you, Lord, for the word. And thank you, Father, the word of the night is charity. And Father, you know and we all know that there isn't a Bible in the world that says it the way the King's Bible says it. It is charity. It is giving without the expectation of receipt. It is giving for no other reason than pure love. Father, teach us that love. Teach us how to respond to other people's needs. Teach us how to be soft toward other people who are struggling even, Father, if they brought it on themselves. Because we did. We did exactly the same as they did. Father, help us to remember that. Teach us about love and teach us about charity. And open up your word to us. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Let me finish reading verse 9 and 10. Use hospitality. What happens where you go when you're sick and you're in bad shape? Hospital. And when you go to the hospital, do you have to give your own medicine? Do you have to fix yourself? Do you have to heal yourself? Do you have to nurse yourself back to health? No, that's done for you. Okay? A lot of hospitals, a lot of hospitals were started by Christians or wannabe Christians opening up places of healing to people who couldn't necessarily pay for it. That's, what it, that's how it started. So use hospitality one to another without, what's that word? And We love to grudge, don't we? Look what I did for them. Look what I did for them. And that's how they talk to me. That's how they treat me. That's grudging. What'd you do it for? What did you do it for? Did you do it for recognition? Do it for so that they could do things your way or like you or, or be on your side on stuff? Is that why you did it? Because if that's why you did it, you did it for the wrong reason. And no wonder you're complaining. But if you just do it and move on and don't worry about whether they appreciated it or not, that's the pure charity love. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So we have this gift, right? God gave you salvation. So is it right to charge money to people to receive that same gift as we got for free? No. Is it right if God has taught you something from his, from his word? And then you say, I'm going to write a book on this and I'm going to sell it for $24.95 plus $10 postage and handling. Is that right? No, it's not right. God gave it to you for free. Why are you trying to make money off of it? Why, why would you charge? Why would you tell people? This is, this is to that, that Trinity Broadcasting Network crowd and Three Angels Broadcasting Network crowd and all these people on radio and television and internet that are trying to, that'll tell you, oh, I've got some anointing. Oh, I got something from the Holy Ghost and I put it down in this four DVD set or I put it in this book and I'll tell you what, it is vital that you have this or you're not going to make it into the kingdom. You're not going to make it successfully. You've got to have this. Now this can be given for your donation and that's a lie. It's not really a donation. They're charging a price and everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. Because if you call them and say, I don't have any money. Will you send me a copy of this book? That turn you down. Most of them will turn you down. Okay? So, if we got it for free, 
we should give it for free. As good stewards. Good stewards. See, a steward in a house pretty much has the control. Let's say, let's say that you, this is a wealthy man. He's a multi-billionaire. And he's got all this stuff. And he's put you in charge of it. Meaning, like Joseph was to Potiphar. Potiphar didn't know anything of what he had other than the food that was set before him every day. This man was so rich, he did not keep track. He put it in Joseph's hand. He said, Joseph, take good care of my stuff. And Joseph did exactly that. And Joseph never one time assumed that one kernel of corn was his. He assumed and knew that it didn't belong to him. And whatever his boss told him to do, that's what he was supposed to do. See, the boss is not always right, but he's always the boss. Amen. So, whatever he says do, that's what you do. And even when it came down to Potiphar's wife, Joseph said, that's not my wife. I'm not taking anything that does not belong to me, and I'm definitely not going to take this man's wife. And he stood for what was right. He was a steward of what Potiphar had, and he recognized that he himself did not own any of it, that it all was Potiphar's. And if Potiphar wanted to give every bit of it away except for a plate of food three times a day, that was Potiphar's choice. That was not Joseph. That was up to Potiphar. Can I get an amen? So think about what God has given to you. Think about what God has given to us. As a church, he's given it to us free of charge. No expectation whatsoever, but we do not own it. The clothes that you wear, the car that you drive, the wallet that's in your back pocket or in your purse, the money that's in your bank account, the blood running through your veins belongs to God. And the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Because it is the Lord's and never ours. Very important to remember. Because I'm telling you, even the lost people, this, this man that sent me this email just really got, got in my mind. Because I understand now that there's people watching what I do and say besides the people who like what I do and say and would just kind of, they I guess they would just kind of mostly agree with everything I do and say, you kind of get what I'm saying. There's other people that probably have a very critical negative attitude toward church and church ministries and church video, internet, or TV ministries. And rightfully so. So I think it is important that what we do while lost people are watching us is to do nothing but exhibit pure Christian charity. Amen? Can you think of a story in the Bible that matches charity shall cover the multitude of sins? Anybody have any idea of a story that you think matches that in the Bible? Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan. That's a good one. Why did that guy, why did that Samaritan stop for that Jewish man? Why did he stop for him? Was it Jewish or Gentile that got beat up? Was it Gentile? But what's been, well, you can tell it's been a while since I read that. But why did he stop and do that? Had mercy on him. He loved him. He cared for him. And he was expecting nothing out of it. He was not going to come back on this man after he got healed up and on his feet and say, uh, look, you owe me for... How long did you stay in this guy's house? You owe me for that. Because the Samaritan paid money and then he said, I'm going to go on my trip. But when I come back, if he's still here and I owe you more, I'll pay it when I get back here to you. He was doing it with the expectation of nothing in return. Now I'm going to say this because I'm going to say this now because it matches what it is that we're talking about. We are set to distribute 5,000 pounds of corn and beans this Friday. 5,000 pounds. 
of it. That was given to us as stewards. And it is our responsibility to be faithful stewards of that. And to do what God has laid on our heart to do, or my heart to do. I wouldn't say that everybody in here has to be part of that. That was something that God led me to do and to be part of. And obviously there are others who have undertaken that responsibility as well. And they have contributed to that. They have donated to that. And that has provided more than what we already are ready to distribute from the last time and this Friday. So, so far, about six and a half to 7,000 pounds of corn and beans from the last time and this time to be distributed. That's stewardship, responsibility. Amen? And I'll tell you something, when God, if God thinks he can trust us to do something like that, that's a big deal. When your boss knows that he can trust you enough to give you a great responsibility, that's a big deal, is it not? Do you not feel the obligation to, to meet the expectations of the boss who put that in your hand said, I think you can do that. I know you've never done this before, but I think, you, Jared, you remember what you went through trying to get the deal to drive that crane, Okay? And now you're doing it. That was a responsibility. And you weren't, I mean, all that time, you weren't sure that you were up to it. But there you are. So anyway, let me show you the story that I had in mind. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Verse 37. Behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner. She was a sinner. Doesn't say what kind of sinner she was, but she was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. I mean, I'm just, I'm not, I don't know per se, but I'm just guessing this woman's a whore. Whether professionally or that's just her. I'm just guessing because apparently this Pharisee knows her. She has a reputation around town of being a certain kind of woman. Okay? And he's all, well, if this man, this, if he's a prophet of God, surely he would know what kind of woman is touching him. Verse 40. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he says, Master, say on. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? You ask yourself the question, which category do you fit in here? The 500 pence debtor or the 50 pence debtor? Okay, you just don't answer, don't shout it out. Just ask yourself the question, which one am I? And by the way, after they're forgiven, does it really matter then who actually sinned the most and who sinned the least? Because their balance is now zero. So that's what the cross does. The cross makes everybody the same when it comes to salvation. Keep that in mind. Don't you ever forget that. I hate religious philosophies that put people on levels and there are factions of christianity that and i've had people tell me that 
Others would tell them, well, you're obviously not on the level that we are. That's why you don't do this, and that's why you don't speak in tongues, and that's why you don't understand our doctrine. You're not on the level that we are. Poo on that. Amen? Yeah, bye-bye. See ya. Okay? So, uh, let's see. Verse 43. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most, and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment wherefore i say unto thee her sins which are many are forgiven for she loved much that to me right there that sticks it with me that charity actually does cover a multitude of sins but to whom little is forgiven the same loveth little and he said unto her thy sins are forgiven and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves who is this that forgiveth sins also and he said unto the woman thy faith hath saved thee go in peace see i'm not going to ask i never ask people how big a sinner are you if people want to come and they want to join our church I never asked them, how big a sinner are now on a scale of one to ten, where would you put yourself as being a sinner? I asked them, do you believe the Bible? And if they say yes, then that right there makes them equal with, I believe, everybody else in this church, including me. Because we just believe the Bible. And whether it was a million sins or 500,000 sins, or 5,000 sins, or 50 sins, or 5 sins. When Christ forgives them, all of the balances are zero, and the scales are equal, and everybody now is exactly the same. But, I can tell you, the people who make the greatest witnesses are the ones whom God has pulled out of the deepest and darkest pit. Am I right on that? So now you think about that because, I mean, there's always going to be some that they see people and they don't understand how they got themselves in that position. But there's always some who look at people and understand exactly how they got themselves in that position. And yes, that, let me just say this. The reason why some people are poor is because they are lazy, they don't want to work, or they're not good at it. Clumsy. Who in here read Amelia Bedelia when you was in school? Is it just me and Melissa? Amelia Bedelia was this children's book character. She was like a maid in a house, and she always got everything wrong. When I can remember one where the, the boss, the woman told her, you need to change the towels. So she went into the bathroom and looked at the towels and got a pair of scissors and cut them in half, and now they're changed. That kind of stuff, okay? That's me when it comes to a lot of things. But you know what? Some people just can't help how they were born. Some people can't help the conditions that they grew up in. Some people can't help how they were raised. Some people just, they didn't have any control over that. And when God brings you out of a lot of sin, you look at people who are in a lot of sin, and instead of immediately just casting judgment on them, you know why they're there because you were there amen so when it says let me go back to this 
Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. I like to keep that verse in my mind because my nature is to judge people. Nowadays, I mean, you look at people and they got their tattoo sleeves and they got their piercing. I, I listen, I'll be honest with you. When I see big old bolts, Frankenstein bolts in a guy's ear, I'm going, there's something wrong with you. Hey, the guy's a sinner. The man's dead and trespasses in sin, and he does not have the leadership of the Holy Ghost in his life and never has. Twice like that. Can God save him? God can save anybody. God can save anybody. And you know what? Those he saves, they don't have to be preached at about how to clean their lives up. All of a sudden, God just gets in them, and all of a sudden, they just want to start cleaning stuff up. I mean, you don't have to hammer it and beat, it, beat them over the head with it all the time and tell them, well, you, you, you got, are you saved? Then get that out of your ear. Listen, God will, God will deal with them about all that stuff. And I have to remember that. I have to remember that when I look at people. I did, it, I did it tonight walking in Walmart. I saw a guy walking in Walmart. I'm not even going to describe him. I just looked at him and said, you filthy scoundrel, you. You little devil, you. Immediately, just like that. Christ died for that little devil. Christ died for that scoundrel. Charity covers then the multitude of sins. And when you remember what you have been forgiven of and start counting up the number of sins that you committed that God freely, freely forgave you of, it makes you look at people in a different light. And if we're going to be evangelists, and especially in this world right now, this world is bad and getting worse. They're suing Mattel because Mattel's not producing enough lesbian Barbies. Do you hear my sister? Ridiculous. Of course it is. But Jesus died for these people. And they, listen, I'm, I'm just like you, sis. I look at people and I judge them and I say, that's nasty, that's disgusting. They, all should, they should all be burned up in hell. So should I. Mike? I just never heard of Barbie. Yeah. Barbie's never actually come out and had a press conference and come out of the closet, okay? Yeah. Did you hear what Jared said? How do we know they're all ain't? Anyway, I'm just, listen, that's charity. Ken dolls of babies? I'd run over every one of them. I, listen, that's the conservative side of me. And there's nothing, listen, that's right. I'm seeing the world right, but... I don't want to forget charity. I don't want to forget it. It's important. She, 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 was for, she loved much because she was forgiven of much. My interview with Adam the other day, he said something I, I never really thought of. But if you go back and look at Samson's life, Samson had a whole list of things that was told to his parents that he should not do as a Nazarite, and if you go look at it, he broke almost every one of them with the exception of his hair. And God still had favor on him. What, and I've said this before, what was the spiritual condition of Sarah when the Lord with those two angels was standing there talking to Abraham about how she was going to have a baby? She laughed, and then when he told her about it, she lied about it. To, she lied in the face of God. And he said, I'm telling you, I know you laughed, but I'm telling you this time next year, you're going to have a baby. He could have, he could have withdrew that promise right then and there because she mocked him. But he didn't. He did it out of grace. And you look in the Bible at all these great saints of the Most High God that did all these wonderful, great things. They were being blessed by God while they were disobedient to God. 
1 Corinthians 8. Now it's touching things offered unto idols. Watch this now. Watch this. This is me right here. Now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. And let's, let's examine how true this is. Those, those people in this world who have gone to Harvard, Yale, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, Caltech, these big, these big universities, and they get a master's degree, and they get a Ph.D., and they have all of this knowledge. They actually do think that they are superior to everybody else in the world, and they are the ones who should be running things in this world. You just, all you got to do is get around them for a little while. I've been around them as far as the intellectualism in the Bible college scene, and I know how they think, and I know how they are. They think that because they can read Greek and they can read a few Hebrew words that they're smarter than the average church member and they know more and all this stuff and it makes them puff up. And I, I got into it with a former, former roommate of mine and we, we were roommates for a little while until we figured out we really didn't like each other and then he moved out and then later on in life he was at one church and I was at another. He was a deacon in a church and we were at camp together and he said, I've told our church that we could hire a new pastor that we, if we hire one that has a degree, we ought to pay him twice the money as a, as a pastor that didn't have a degree. And I said, why? What does that letter is behind his name? How does in the world does that make him a better man and a better Christian and a better Bible believer and a better preacher and a better soul winner? How is it that those letters make him any better than anybody else? He didn't like what I said. But knowledge puffeth up, and I get that. Because we start thinking that God's given us some special, unique things from the Bible. I, I, my, my goodness, we believe the King James Bible, right? That means we've got the real Word of God and everybody else has got a fake and phony. And if we're not careful, we'll get all puffed up about who we are and what, and what Bible we have and how great we are that we have that and how everybody else is all messed up. But charity edifieth. I would like to be known... By the love that I have for my enemies than for what I know that my enemies don't know. And I'm not there yet. I don't think I have that reputation yet. So knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as yet, nothing yet as he ought to know. Think about all the things in the Bible that you know versus all the things in the Bible that you don't know. Right? Because look back at the last several years of your walk with Christ. What do you know now versus what you knew then? You know far more than you used to know, right? But you're not anywhere near where you're going to be. So, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. God is not, listen to this now, God's not putting us on a little pedestal because one guy knows more Bible verses and knows what they mean more than another guy. Do you love God? God knows you, and God knows that about you. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. That's the charity chapter. Charity chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. This is charity. This is what it is. Let's look at, um, start in verse 4. Charity suffereth long. So to think about this in your relationship with your wife, your children, your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters here at church, your pastor, me, I'm to think about how I react to you. I'm to think about how I think about my wife, how I think about my children, how I think about my grandchildren, how I think about my mom, my in-laws, my, everybody that, people that watch online. I'm to think this way about them. I'm to suffer long with everybody. Which means that if I know that in your life you're not, I don't think you're doing right, I'm going to wait and I'm going to suffer with you and I'm going to pray until God makes things right in you because I've tried making people right and it don't work. It's better to let God do it. So I'm going to wait on God. 
Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity doesn't listen to, hey, everybody listen to me now. Charity doesn't say mean things to people. Charity don't bite people's heads off. Charity would rather bite her tongue off than bite somebody's head off. Charity is kind. Charity envieth not. Well, how come they got that and I don't have that? How come they got this and how, how come they're like this and I'm not like... Charity don't, charity don't do that. Charity says, boy, I'm so, glad, you, I'm so glad, glad God blessed you that way. That makes me so happy. And I listen, I know it's not in your nature. I know it's not in my nature. I don't look at people like that. Amen? I, I'm just... I'm. I'm as rotten as everybody else is, but it's not right. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Remember, what, that's what we just read, isn't it? Knowledge will puff us up. Charity won't. Charity will put us at least on an equal keel with other people or under them. The pastor in India, Pastor Rock, they deal with a caste system in India. Bad. They have levels of humans in India, and it's, it's still part of their life and their culture. One person is way up here, and one person is way down here, and they get treated that way, openly, publicly. That's, and he's got to deal with that. As a part of their culture, he's got to deal with that. Charity, verse 5, charity does not behave itself unseemly. That means that somebody pulls out in front of you, you don't just floor it, pull out in front of them and hit your brakes. Amen. Charity seeketh not her own. Charity doesn't say, what am I going to get out of this? If I, if I donate this or if I do this, what am I going to get out of this? Charity don't do that. Charity doesn't always need a tax receipt. Now, I'm not against you getting a tax receipt. Listen, if Uncle Sam shouldn't get it, he shouldn't get it. Amen? That's the only reason why I would want a tax receipt for something I give. But charity doesn't need a tax receipt. Um, charity seeketh not her own. Charity is not easily provoked. How many, ti- how many times does it take to push you till you push back? One, two, three. Charity thinketh no evil. Charity rejoiceth not in iniquity. Charity rejoices in the truth. Charity beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. If you love a wife, You'll love her for life. You'll long suffer with her. You'll love her even if she hates you and runs off and leaves you. Like God loved Israel. Amen? And I'm not, listen, none of this is easy. All of this has to come by way of a gift of the Spirit. And if the Spirit is not in you to do it, you won't do it. It's that simple. But it's the right way to be and it's the right thing to do. Especially when one is suffering. And maybe we might say, well, they're suffering because they did it to themselves or it's their own fault or this way or, or whatever. Charity doesn't see people that way. That's not supposed to be, we're not supposed to think that way. Maybe you know it, you know, in the back of your mind, maybe you know it. But charity will go ahead and bless somebody anyway, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. Amen? So what if there's somebody in Kenya this weekend that already has plenty of food, and yet they show up and get in line wanting free food? It's not for us to decide. Who's going to get them? God's going to get them. He knows. He knows knows what they're doing. He knows they're just stealing food. Okay? God will take care of it. God's the judge. Let God handle it. Let God have it. Amen? Amen. Tonight, 
when we pray, I want you to think about somebody you hate. Okay? I want you to think about somebody you're mad at. Think about somebody that's done you wrong or done somebody you know wrong. Don't you think about them pray about, and pray for them. Pray that God will save them. Pray that God will change them. Don't you dare pray that God gets them, makes them go to hell. Okay? You know what you're doing? You're relieving yourself of a burden that you're not meant to carry. And you'll find that you're happier loving them and not caring what they have done or, and will do. Then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Then you, amen, you won't, you won't, you, you won't need to watch Dr. Phil five times a week, amen. Okay, I'm just saying, just, I, listen, I need this. I need this kind of stuff. Because I sometimes I have a problem loving people the way I should. And it ain't right for a preacher to be that way. Amen? Do you want me to love you unconditionally? No matter what you do. No matter how rotten you are. No matter how many times you show up for church or don't show up. You want me to love you? Okay, I will. I promise I will.